Well, welcome everyone. This is Randall Ruta. I am president and CEO of ARDA, the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association. And I'm delighted that all of you can join us for a very important briefing today. It's a national briefing on COVID-19 and autoimmune disease. And our focus is research insights, treatment, and prevention. And I'm delighted that we have serving as our moderator and also the chair of ARDA's Scientific Advisory Board, Dr. Betty Diamond. Dr. Diamond, please go ahead. Well, good afternoon. I'm Betty Diamond, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this national briefing on COVID-19 and autoimmune disease, research insights, treatment, and prevention. This national briefing is being hosted, as you heard, by the American Autoimmune Related Diseases Association, called ARDA. Uh, I serve as head of the Center of Autoimmune Musculoskeletal and Hematopoietic Diseases at the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research and chair, chair uh, ARDA's Scientific Advisory Board. I'm pleased to welcome our three speakers. Dr. Zachary Wallace is a rheumatologist and clinical researcher at the Massachusetts General Hospital and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He'll lead off today's program talking about current research related to uh, COVID-19 in individuals with autoimmune disease. He'll be followed by Dr. Arturo Casadevall, who's chair of the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And he'll be discussing uh, current therapies and therapies that are in the pipeline. And the third speaker will be Dr. Daniel Rotrosen, Director of the Division of Allergy, Immunology, and Transplantation at NIAID of the National Institutes of Health. And he'll be describing pathways for vaccine development and disseminating vaccines to prevent infection. ARDA and coalition member organizations understand that this pandemic represents a serious health threat and certainly a serious concern to persons with autoimmune diseases who often have underlying conditions that may put them at risk for serious illness. There's been little dissemination of information specific to those with autoimmune disease, and we're hoping to change that today. With hundreds of individuals submitting questions about COVID-19 on registration to this event, uh, we will take up several at the end of the webinar and try to address others after this event. So visit the ARDA website at www.aarda.org to connect with the NIH, the CDC, and coalition member resources that directly affect, address the concerns of the autoimmune community and people with conditions like your own. So I'm going to turn this over now to Dr. Zach Wallace, who will talk about recent studies of COVID-19 in people with autoimmune diseases. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks very much for having me. Um, if we could just go to the next slide. So yes, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, as part of my presentation, I'm pleased to share results from work that we've done as part of the COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance, as well as other um, similar registries. Um, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So from the beginning, it's been clear that the COVID-19 pandemic would have a major impact on patients with autoimmune diseases and their providers. And I've outli outlined a few of those here. I think first, there's been a natural concern among patients and providers that the immunosuppressants we use to treat, to treat diseases may increase the risk of COVID-19 and poor outcomes. Um, but it's also recognized that many of the medicines we use to treat autoimmune diseases, many of these um, immunosuppressants and immunomodulators are also being studied as treatments for COVID-19, especially the severe inflammatory response that we observe in patients who are quite ill. Another potential impact of the pandemic has been on healthcare access for our patient population since the pandemic has forced a sudden switch for many um, from in-person visits to telemedicine visits. 
Um, third, there's, there, there was a lot of interest early on in several of the medications that we use to treat autoimmune diseases. And as a rheumatologist, one of those was hydroxychloroquine. Um, and this led to drug shortages, which limited access to this life-saving medication for many of our patients. Um, fourth, we are now beginning to see some autoimmune conditions such as MISC or the Kawasaki-like syndrome in children as sequelae of COVID-19, raising the question of whether COVID-19 infection exacerbates or leads to autoimmune disease. And finally, you know, in the U.S. in particular, the economic impact of the pandemic has led millions of Americans to lose health insurance, um, which has obviously impacted their care. So for today's, for today's talk, I'll focus on the first issue and touch on some of the others. Um, next slide, please. So I'll uh, start off by just speaking ab about the limited data we have on the risk of COVID-19 in patients with autoimmune diseases and spend the bulk of my time on the second bullet point here, which is the outcomes of COVID-19 infection in patients who have autoimmune diseases. Um, a lot of the data I'll present are from several large international registries that were assembled to address these questions, and they focus primarily on patients with rheumatic disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and psoriasis. Um, I'll touch briefly on racial and ethnic differences in outcomes in, in the autoimmune disease population and, and as well as on healthcare access. Um, next slide, please. So a recent meta-analysis um, tried to estimate what the risk of COVID-19 was in patients with autoimmune diseases using a lot of the available published literature. They found that patients with autoimmune diseases, particularly rheumatic diseases, since that's where most of this work has been done, might have higher odds of developing COVID-19 infection. This may not be surprising since we often worry that our immunosuppressive medications increase the risk of infection, um, but their impact on viral illness risk has remained less well understood. Um, in this study, the investigators found that the association between autoimmune disease and risk of COVID-19 was strongly driven by glucocorticoid use. However, these, these findings um, are susceptible to a number of potential biases, and I think we're limited in sort of the conclusions that we can draw from them. This does raise concern, but, but because of some of the biases, I think it's hard to know whether or not there really truly is a higher risk of infection. Um, I will need to wait for more seroprevalence studies and, and studies that use other approaches to fully understand the risk of COVID-19 in patients with autoimmune diseases. Um, next slide, please. There was a, another study that um, tried to get at this question of what is the risk of COVID-19 infection in patients with autoimmune diseases. It was done rather early on in the pandemic. Um, it was done by investigators in England. They performed this large study using a general population database and examined what factors are associated with COVID-19 related death as a way of, of estimating what the risk of infection might be. Um, in, in these analyses, they found that there was an association between some autoimmune diseases, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, or psoriasis, with the, which they sort of lumped together here, um, or conditions requiring immunosuppression, and found that these were associated with an increased risk of, of death. Um, you know, this, this study was very, um, is important. It's an important step forward. There remain some concerns about um, potential issues with the design and other limitations, but it does raise, um, raise concern that certain patients with autoimmune diseases may have a higher risk of COVID-19. Um, next slide, please. More of the data that we have has to do with how patients who have autoimmune diseases do once the, if they have infections from COVID-19. Um, so this was a multi-center study here that I'm showing you that my group did um, in, our, in our system, looking at how COVID-19 patients with rheumatic disease do compared to those without rheumatic disease. We um, found patients with rheumatic disease and comparators who were similar in a number of ways um, to try and uh, try and address this. We found that the risk of hospitalization, ICU admission, and death were similar in both groups, which was reassuring. Um, the risk of mechanical ventilation, as you can see here, I highlighted that, was higher in the group of patients who had rheumatic diseases. But when we accounted for some of the other medical problems that these patients often have, we found that the, this association became um, less strong more, and more attenuated, suggesting that the risk of poor outcomes that we might be seeing in some patients with rheumatic diseases may have more to do with the greater comorbidity burden in this population rather than a disease itself. We've since replicated this in some other larger data sets, and it really does suggest that, it's, that it might be more about the comorbidities that patients with autoimmune diseases have that drive some of their outcomes. 
Um, next slide, please. So diving into this question a little bit more, like what are the factors um, in patients with autoimmune diseases that drive um, some of them having worse outcomes? Um, I turn now uh, to a number of studies that have evaluated these, these questions in, in autoimmune disease patients. The data I'm showing you here are from the first paper that was published by the COVID-19 Global Rheumatology Alliance. It included the first 600 rheumatic disease patients reported in the registry. In it, we found that older patients and those with comorbidities, so similar risk factors that we've that have been described in the general population, um, were associated with worse outcomes. And worse outcomes in this study were sort of um, uh, estimated by those who required hospitalization. In addition to, to older age and, and patients who had other medical problems, we found that higher doses of glucocorticoids were associated with worse outcomes. And that was somewhat interesting given what we now know about the benefits of dexamethasone for those with severe COVID-19. Um, and this observation uh, that patients who were on high do higher doses of steroid um, before their infection may highlight the importance of the timing of exposure to glucocorticoids in terms of COVID-19 outcomes, where um, many of the patients with autoimmune diseases who are on steroids for long periods of time prior to infection may have a higher risk of, of having poor outcomes, whereas those who um, have COVID-19 and are then started on steroids to try and treat the severe inflammatory response may do better. A somewhat surprising finding from this, from this GRA study was that those on biologic DMARDs actually had better outcomes. As you can see on the table on the right here, um, where the odds of being hospitalized were a little over 50% lower in those on biologics compared to those not on um, these medications. And this association was strongly driven by those on TNF inhibitors. So next slide, please. We've expanded upon these observations in a follow-up study that should be published soon. It included 3,729 patients that were enrolled in the GRA registry. We examined factors that were independently associated with an increased risk of, in death, of death. So the first paper looked at hospitalization, and here we looked at death. In this group of patients with rheumatic, disease, rheumatic diseases and COVID-19, we found that certain medications were associated with a higher risk of death, particularly sulfasalazine, conventional immuno suppressants such as azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, and others, as well as rituximab. We also confirmed our prior finding that higher dose glucocorticoids were associated with worse outcomes, in this case, death. These, these findings require confirmation of future studies, but it's interesting to note that the association between sulfasalazine and poor outcomes had been, had been suggested in sort of machine learning models um, at the beginning of the pandemic and have also been um, observed in other populations, as we'll discuss. Um, in addition, this data supports concerns expressed by many that the impact of rituximab exposure on antibody production could be harmful in COVID-19 um, if antibody production is in fact important for viral control, which it seems to be. Um, next slide, please. So similar to the observations that we made in the rheumatic disease population, um, the IBD community established a physician reported registry. The results of, of their first study are, are included here. And as in, as in the rheumatic disease population and the general population, again, we see that older age and comorbidities are associated with worse outcomes, such as hospitalization. Um, uh, they also observed, as we did, that glucocorticoid use and sulfasalazine use were associated with poor outcomes. So we're seeing a similar story evolving here. And finally, TNF inhibitors appeared to be protective in this study, similar to what we observed um, in patients with uh, rheumatic disease. So next slide, please. They also had a, um, a follow-up study that was recently published. It included a larger number of patients. So this study of theirs included 1,439 patients in their registry and looked at the association between certain medications and severe outcomes defined as ICU, uh, uh, requ requiring ICU level care, ventilator, um, or death. Um, they, they confirmed the findings that TNF inhibitors seem to be, or at least trended towards being protective towards having one of these severe outcomes. So again, patients on TNF inhibitors did better. Um, but what they also observed was that certain immunosuppressives, particularly things like azathioprine, um, either as monotherapy or when combined with TNF inhibitors, tended to be associated with worse outcomes. Um, so again, there's this story coming together that some medications are beneficial um, when you have COVID-19, um, others are, are, are maybe harmful. Uh, next slide, please. 
As I mentioned, there's also a physician reported registry of patients with psoriasis who developed COVID-19, and they really arrived at very similar observations that were seen in the rheumatic disease population as well as the um, IBD population. Um, next slide, please. So throughout the studies that I've shared with you today, just a few examples, um, there are others as well, suggesting that patients with a variety of autoimmune diseases, including rheumatic diseases, psoriasis, and IBD, um, we, we've seen through these studies that, that um, risk factors for poor outcomes resemble those reported in the general population, including older age and comorbidity, but certain medications seem to be beneficial, especially TNF inhibitors. This was, this was reassuring and somewhat surprising, um, and while there remain some concerns about the design of these studies and whether other factors may be contributing to these observations, there's also reason to believe that the benefits of TNF inhibitors and other biologics may have to do with their impact on the immune response to COVID-19. Um, this figures from a recently published study in which investigators observed that in contrast to other infections, patients with severe COVID-19 infections did not form germinal centers as part of their response. And these germinal centers are really important for the, for the body to be able to elaborate the important robust immune response that's needed to control an infection. And it may be that the germinal centers cannot form because there's too much TNF in the area essentially. And so this led the authors of this paper to hypothesize that TNF inhibitors may actually be beneficial in COVID-19. And that's what we've observed and what we were just talking about. So there's actually a number of trials now underway evaluating the use of TNF inhibitors to treat COVID-19. Um, next slide. And I just want to touch briefly on racial disparities. Um, we've, we've heard a lot about um, differences in outcomes according to race and ethnicity in the general population. And this is just to show that we've seen the same thing in our rheumatology cohort. Um, the GRA registry found that there were associations between um, being Black or Latinx and having poor outcomes such as hospitalization and ventilation when compared to um, white patients in our registry. And I think this just really highlights the need for the rheumatology community to think more about how we can improve outcomes for our most vulnerable patients. The next slide, please. Um, and finally, I just want to touch on, on the, some of the indirect effects of COVID-19 on patients with autoimmune diseases. Um, as we know, this really caused a, a sudden shift in care from in-person to telemedicine, and a lot of people were unable to get in for visits or to have visits. Um, and that's reflected in this slide here. This is data from a rheumatology registry capturing about 40% of practices in the United States, showing that um, in March of 2020, compared to one year prior, there was a significant decline in the percentage of visits that were occurring. And so we'll see what impact this ultimately has on, on patient care uh, moving forward. But it, it's clear that a lot of patients were having difficulty accessing um, their rheumatology care and I'm sure other care as well. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I just wanna wrap up by summarizing a few things. Most of the data we have here is from patients with um, rheumatic diseases, psoriasis and IBD. Um, patients with autoimmune diseases may be at higher risk for COVID-19, but the data on this topic is limited. Patients with autoimmune diseases may have worse outcomes compared to the general population, and this may have to do with the comorbidity burden, but many patients do quite well. Um, among patients with autoimmune diseases, there are certain disease-specific factors that are associated with worse outcomes, including glucocorticoids and sulfasalazine, but there are also several factors that may be associated with better outcomes, particularly biologic DMARDs and TNF inhibitors. And we all need to be aware of the racial disparities that exist in COVID-19 outcomes, both in the general population, but also in our rheumatic disease population. And next slide. And this is my last slide, which touches on a number of the questions that I think are outstanding that we need to address moving forward and several of which we'll come to at the end of the talk. So I wanna thank you for your attention and happy to pass it off now. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. I think this has been very informative for patients. Uh, we'll now turn to Arturo Casa Duval, who will uh, address therapeutics. So thank you for being with us, Arturo. Thank sure. you, Betty. Can you hear me? Yes. Please. Uh, so I'm going to focus primarily on convalescent plasma. Uh, convalescent plasma has emerged as a major therapy. To give you some numbers, over 100,000 people have been treated in the United States alone. And last week alone, over 10,000 plasma units were dispensed. So uh, a little bit of background. Next slide. So this is, in early 2020, there was no effective therapy for COVID-19. 
Uh, but uh, those of us who are interested in history knew that this had been used in many past epidemics uh, since 1918. And there was considerable human experience that it was relatively safe and positively effective. Uh, plasma is widely used throughout the world and its risk and benefits are known to both physicians and regulators. And the important thing to keep in mind is that convalescent plasma differs from regular plasma only that it comes from COVID survivors. So basically, it's a well-known established uh, product. Uh, and the use of convalescent plasma is supported by more than 130 years of immunological studies. This is something for which we know the mechanism. The mechanism of antibody action is pretty well characterized, so you at least have mechanistic causality. And I want to add that the first Nobel Prize was given for this. So we're talking about something that is really old. Next slide. So in the early days uh, when uh, January, um, those of us in infectious disease were pretty concerned that this was not containable. And I was very struck by the fact that people were talking about a lot of things. They were talking about antivirals, monoclonals, they were talking about vaccines, but no one was seen to be talking about plasma therapy. And the question was how to get the word out. Well, I'm deputy editor of the Journal of Clinical Investigation. I'm an editor in chief of M Bio Scientific Journals. I could have put an editorial there, but that wouldn't have done anything. Uh, what, we, what was needed was to get the word out into the public domain. So I decided to try to write an op-ed. The New York Times, the Washington Post, Bloomberg News did not want it, but like everything in life, it's luck. It was sent to the Wall Street Journal on a day in which the market tanked because of COVID and they took it right away. And this, uh, they not only took it, but they rewrote it. So now I had 650 words statement that was extremely well written. And what I did is I sent it to all my friends. Next slide. Uh, and the, uh, well, there is some animation loss here, but let me just tell you that in March, 2020, uh, things moved very fast. The, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial led to a group of physicians getting together throughout the country to create the Convalescent Plasma Project. This is a grassroots effort. It did not involve the government, did not involve any industry. Uh, these are no patents here. There's nobody's gonna make any money. Uh, and it rapidly caught a lot of media interest. I had my 15 minutes of fame. Uh, and uh, it what resulted was that the FDA began to receive overwhelming numbers of requests for plasma use. Basically, every hospital in the country wanted to know about this. And that would have meant that, that an, an, an investigational new drug application would have been to be put in for every hospital. And instead, what the FDA did was it issued a contract to the Mayo Clinic because they have a national IRB. And this was the extended access protocol that has been in the news and which is shortened by EAP. And I'll, I'll mention some more about it. Next slide. So in the unexpected then happened. The FDA thought that maybe 500 or 1,000 people would be treated. Instead, thousands of people began to be treated in the United States. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are way past 100,000 already. Uh, this, um, most of this usage occurred outside of randomized clinical trials. Why? The randomized clinical trials were set up in New York. And by the time they were set up, and they had no patients. And then most of this unit usage began to occur in hospitals with no access to randomized controlled trials. Uh, donation campaigns ensure a steady supply of convalescent plasma. Today, plasma is available. Uh, there is no scarcity, but it's important to know that this was driven by thousands of physicians who embraced it. And as all, and this inevitably happens, criticism mounted of the law. How could the FDA, how could the government, how could the United States allow all of this to be used without safety and efficacy data? Next slide. So the two questions everybody wants to answer is, is it safe and does it work? Next slide. The safety data was relatively easy to answer uh, because um, the Mayo Clinic, uh, the, under the leadership of Michael Joyner, uh, had this contract and one could follow uh, the, 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 the hospital cases of people who received it. So by May, we had about 5,000 patients in this database. And uh, it was clear that uh, this was giving a unit of plasma, two units of plasma was being pretty well tolerated. 
Uh, by June, it was up to 20,000. And the numbers of any complications were very, very small relative to what is associated with plasma. But most important is that there were concerns about the, this in the bottom is a type, which should be antibody dependent enhancement and cytokine storms. Early on, people were worried that if you gave antibody that you could, that you could uh, trigger a cytokine storm or perhaps the phenomenon of antibody dependent enhancement. It turns out that that did not, that was not the case. And that is going to turn very, it, that's very important because plasma clears the way for monoclonals and clears the way for a lot of the vaccine studies that don't really have to worry about this phenomenon since uh, it's really not seen uh, with the administration of specific antibody. Next slide. So is it working? There are four lines of evidence that I'm going to cover with you. One is the extended access program data analysis which suggested lower mortality with early use of high tidal plasma. There are greater than 10 observational studies from all over the world showing large reductions in mortality if given early before the ICU. Important, antibody therapies for 100 years have been known to work best if you give them early. This it is not a therapy that is expected to have a major effect for people that are very sick. And yet that important lesson has been forgotten and you will see, uh, I'll show you examples where clinical trials are designed in which it is used very late. So whenever you hear anything about this, ask yourself, did they give it early and did they uh, have enough antibody in the units? There have been five randomized controlled trials, all suboptimal, but all provide some encouragement. And I will tell you about the experiments in nature that are in fact very relevant, I think, to rheumatologists because the, what is emerging is that plasma has a beneficial effect in immunocompromised individuals who often cannot clear uh, this infection. Let's take a look at some of these reports. Next slide. So this is the data on the extended access protocol. You can download it. It's, uh, it's in a preprint, it's in review in a journal. So uh, this is the experience as of late July. Uh, if you give, and this, everyone in this group has been treated. So. What, what the FDA and Mayo and us try to do is say, you have, a, you have a cohort where everybody's been treated. You don't have a negative control group. Can you find a signal of efficacy in that case? So in fact, two major signals of efficacy emerge. If you give it early in the first three days, mortality is a lot lower than after day four. And most important from a scientific point of view is there was a dose response. And the dose response showed that those who receive plasma with high titer had lower mortality than those who received plasma with lower titer. Now, you, we, don't, we know that this is not a relative issue. We, this is an absolute reduction because the overall mortality in this group is half what is for hospitalized patients. So basically, this study was able to find signals of efficacy on a group where everyone had presumably already benefited from it. So the dose response is very important. And second, uh, I want to add that in, uh, here on the, you see this other study from Israel, it's been pretty much confirmed uh, by an Israeli study. Next slide. So observational studies are beginning to be published. Uh, two major ones are out. Uh, one of them is in Nature Medicine from Sinai Hospitals. The red lines there are plasma treated groups. The blue lines are their controls. They did uh, two, at least two control groups. And uh, the story is that if given before people get into the unit, it is associated with a significant reduction in mortality. Methodist Hospital uh, in Texas, this is the preliminary study. They have another study, much larger, essentially confirming this. Uh, again, uh, you can see the lines separated, red lines. Uh, uh, the blue lines in mortality is, uh, is, is much lower than the ones that are not transfused. Next slide. First randomized uh, clinical trial done in China. Very well done, but they run out of patients. They have to stop. They can't really get to answer the question of mortality, but they have enough data to say that if you give it before the unit, people do better. Uh, in fact, the effect that they got with only a fraction of the patients is comparable to what we know what remdesivir does. Next slide. Uh, it will show you the five randomized clinical trials that are available. 
Uh, they are from China, Netherlands, Spain, India, and Iraq. I just told you about the China one. Similar experience happened in the Netherlands. They saw a reduction in mortality. It wasn't significant. They had a premature termination. Spain basically used it very early in uh, therapy, and they got, had zero mortality in patients that were treated within a day or two of, of admission. Uh, they almost got to significance, and then they had to stop because uh, the, they controlled the epidemic in Madrid. But I, can, I heard yesterday the trial is being restarted, and they are up to 300 patients because, as you know, COVID is surging in Europe, so we expect that there will be additional data from there. Uh, I'm just going to run to the bo bottom farm first from Iraq. Small study. They did get significance. They dropped mortality considerably, but it was small. They had a quirky uh, randomization, and they also show recovery time. So the one that has been in the news, uh, <laughs> negative news gets a lot more press than positive news when it comes to plasma. We don't know why, but it's reality. It's this study that appeared uh, in the British Medical Journal last Friday from India. They saw no difference in mortality. However, they did see that, uh, that it worked as an antiviral that it, and it reduced symptoms. But when you read the paper, about a third of the units had almost no antibody. And it was used very late. And the reason we know it was used very late was because over 80% of the patients had their own neutralizing antibody. So we are talking about giving antibody on top of antibody very late in the disease. And is, what's surprising to me is that they still got some results at a time in which you would not necessarily expect antibody to work. Next slide. So uh, this is... Uh, for we, we keep a meta-analysis that we continuously update of all the public uh, studies. Uh, if you go to the meta-archives, a new uh, preprint was deposited today, uh, uh, keeping track of it. So regardless of what you think about meta-analysis, they do provide a way to put all the data together. And when you put all the data together, depending on, on the number of studies, the, the reduction in mortality changes between 50 and 60%. Uh, and, and it is uh, statistically significant. Next slide. So in August 23rd, the FDA issued emergency use authorization for convalescent plasma and a controversy immediately ensued. Uh, you can read the headlines in the papers. I'm not gonna go there. I will only point out to you that this is a tempest in a teapot. The United States was already operating under the EUA conditions. Uh, basically plasma was being used in the United States but it, this addressed an issue of equity. Uh, poor hospitals had a lot of trouble getting plasma because of the uh, computer work that was necessary to register patients. And when you look at the law, the law basically says that you need reasonable efficacy and probable efficacy, reasonable safety and probable efficacy. And it, based on the data that I show you, I think most, recent, most reasonable people would conclude that it met the standards. And then there was all these papers about the difference between the NIH and the FDA. And, and, and really what this is, it's just a discussion about differences in certainty. The NIH felt that uh, randomized controlled trials needed to be completed. The FDA felt that the data was there for this. They were actually both right. One good outcome of this is that the NIH has put 40 to $50 million to complete ongoing randomized controlled trials. And those will be expected uh, results from that in the next few months. Next slide. In, at Hopkins, we have two trials going on, both in the outpatient space. Uh, one is for prophylaxis led by Shmuel Shoham. The other one is, is early ambulatory led by David Sullivan. Uh, Dan Hanley supervising both. He's got tremendous experience in clinical trials. These are rapidly accruing patients. Uh, we think that these will provide very clean data because uh, these patients are not on steroids, these patients are not on remdesivir, these patients are at home, and they are being treated with high titer plasma, very well characterized, the control group is getting plasma from prior to the epidemic, and um, hopefully we'll have results soon. Next slide. Uh, my last slide. So convalescent plasma is available through the United States. Uh, plasma use is under emergency use authorization. Uh, it's remarkable that this happened within five months after first use for a product that does not have a pharmaceutical sponsor. This is a movement that has been driven largely by physicians. Definitive data from randomized controlled trials is not available, although the data that is available is 
favorable. Uh, importantly, convalescent plasma has cleared the way for monoclonal and vaccines. It showed that there were really no major antibody death dependent enhancement concerns, and this took a major concern off the table. Supplies are plentiful as recruitment campaigns have geared up throughout the country. Um, so uh, deployment of plasma was driven by physicians. Uh, there is no pharmaceutical company involved. Numerous of randomized clinical trials are underway, and we should expect a lot more data in the next few months. However, one of the things that this epidemic has shown has been the limitations of randomized controlled trials as an epistemic instrument. And I'll give you just one thought. If you design, if you, if you design a randomized controlled trial in June of this year, based on what was known in June, that trial will be obsolete by August, since there is a very rapid accrual of knowledge and, and the strength of randomized controlled trials, which is fixed design, cannot accommodate new information. And the bottom thing, just humor me, is a back of the envelope calculation. Uh, I stress if, with the big if, we know that 100,000 patients have been treated in the United States. In hospital mortality, on average, since March, about 20%. Plasma, based on the meta-analysis, drops by about 50% when used early uh, with sufficient antibody. Then about 10,000 people have been saved by plasma alone. And with that, I end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arturo. And we're now going to turn to Dan Rotrosen, who will be presenting the NIH perspective on COVID vaccines. Thank you, Betty. Um, just uh, to begin, I want to check that you can hear me because I was on by phone earlier and that got disconnected and now I'm back on the uh, internet. So please let me know if you can hear me. We can hear you. We can hear you. Terrific. All right. Well, we'll go ahead with that. So uh, thank you uh, to Betty and to Arda for organizing this webinar. I think uh, these are all very important topics and uh, very timely. Um, if you uh, go to my first slide, uh, this and the next, uh, uh, actually move to the second slide, this and the next um, uh, a few slides recap some of what you've heard already and are here simply to highlight the scale of the problem and why a uh, COVID vaccine uh, is going to be so important. Uh, we are at um, 44 uh, million cases as of a couple of uh, uh, days ago worldwide and over uh, 1 million deaths globally. On the next slide, uh, you will see um, the picture in the United States, um, close to 9 million cases, uh, 225,000 deaths, and as of last night, uh, 89,000 new cases per day. That is um, one case per second. Uh, these are truly astonishing and sobering figures. Go to the next slide, please. So it's not just the severe or uh, uh, critical illnesses we need to prevent. People who are asymptomatic or those with mild to moderate disease are also important and they might recover fully and quickly, uh, but they're a transmission risk for others. And if you go to the next slide, um, the people at increased risk for severe disease fall into two general categories, as you've heard, older adults and people of any age with certain underlying conditions. On the next slide, uh, on the left panel, you can see the importance of age. It's just uh, striking. Plotted here are COVID hospitalizations per 100,000 uh, people in the uh, general population. And close to 1% of people over 85 years uh, of age, and more than a half a percent of people in the 75 to 84 year old category have been hospitalized for COVID. On the right are the odds ratios for severe COVID across various diseases, some of which you've heard about. Obesity, kidney disease, diabetes, and hypertension stand out in particular. And at the bottom of this graph are a few other diseases that uh, perhaps surprisingly don't confer much additional risk. 
On the next slide, you'll see uh, how race and ethnicity also play into the big picture. Whether you look at uh, US COVID cases on the left or COVID deaths on the right, particularly striking here is the mortality rate among Blacks and African Americans, uh, more than twice that of whites and Asians. If you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see that uh, wrapping uh, this all together, it was evident uh, by February or March that the global spread and the severity of COVID would have uh, devastating consequences. And the old ways of developing, manufacturing, testing, and delivering vaccines just wouldn't work. And those were the conclusions of this and of many similar articles published over recent months that we'd need uh, truly unprecedented collaboration and information sharing uh, and the um, uh, marshalling of intellectual, scientific, financial, and physical resources to produce and distribute billions of doses of safe and effective vaccines. And on the next slide, um, this effort came to be known as Operation Warp Speed. OWS is a partnership spanning multiple federal agencies and vaccine manufacturers. The FDA is not formally an OS, uh, OWS member, but uh, FDA provides consultation and interim review across the development pathway, uh, much more so than the FDA would uh, ordinarily engage with companies um, bringing a product for licensure. And, uh, OWS provides a coordinated testing and evaluation of advanced stage vaccine candidates under harmonized protocols. Uh, while these vaccines aren't being compared in head-to-head -head trials, the uh, protocols are similar enough and they're being uh, monitored by a common uh, data and safety monitoring board that hopefully will be able to make some meaningful comparisons and draw conclusions that, um, that bridge these uh, different um, vaccine clinical trials. Two important points at the bottom of the uh, slide. Uh, the financial risks of this accelerated timeline are borne by the manufacturers and the governmental sponsors. Uh, not compromised in any way uh, are the scientific integrity and the safety of uh, clinical trial participants. And um, not compromised also are the FDA decision-making um, processes on uh, vaccine licensure or uh, access under uh, EUA. So please go to the next slide. Um, one thing that I haven't spent too much time on is that very basic research has also contributed to the speed and likely success of the OWS efforts. And within days of isolating the uh, virus, it was genetically sequenced and key structural features were determined by uh, X-ray crystallography and a fairly new technology called cryo-electron uh, microscopy. Um, and we learned uh, from uh, these studies that the coronavirus uh, spike has a domain on its tip that binds to the respiratory epithelium via the host uh, ACE2. Um, uh, protein, that's the receptor for uh, this virus. And um, another important point was that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a, is a large uh, genome virus. Uh, it is relatively stable and the stability contributes to its infectivity. Uh, while most of the infections probably occur through the respiratory uh, epithelium, the virus appears to survive the stomach and can infect the uh, intestinal epithelium and may gain access uh, from there to the circulation and uh, infect the lung uh, also by the circulation. And we also know now that there are multiple virus proteins that are involved in immune evasion. On the next slide, uh, here's that atomic level structure of the spike protein with its uh, receptor binding domain at the top colored in green. And uh, as I think uh, is uh, uh, pretty widely known now, all of the leading vaccine candidates use the spike or its receptor binding domain, which is a, a small portion of the spike uh, as the vaccine immune engine uh, delivered either as a subunit protein uh, 
or encoded in RNA or the DNA of uh, adenoviral vectors. If you go to the next slide, um, this is a schematic that shows a prototypical phase three vaccine efficacy trial. In these phase three studies, the 30 to 60,000 volunteers are randomized to receive vaccine or placebo, and they and the study investigators are blinded as to their group assignment. For most of the vaccines, they'll get two doses, 28 days apart. Uh, and vaccine trials differ from most clinical trials you may be familiar with, where we're interested in knowing if a medication changes the course or severity of a disease over months or years. Uh, in contrast, in vaccine trials, we're interested in a singular event, that is, does the vaccine prevent infection? So these trials are typically event-driven. Rather than continuing for a fixed time, they'll go until a pre-specified number of events occurs, and then the Data Safety uh, Monitoring Board will um, evaluate uh, uh, those events and determine um, whether they're in the vaccine group or the placebo group. And, um, if uh, they're largely in the placebo group, then we have a um, effective vaccine. If you go to the next slide, um, this recaps some of those features. Um, uh, all of the trials now are enrolling uh, adults. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine uh, study is now advancing down to 12 year olds, but for the most part, um, uh, larger scale studies in children and pregnant women will follow. Um, the FDA is gonna require durability of protection of at least two months after the, uh, the second vaccine dose. Uh, presumably uh, vaccines that meet this bar will protect much longer, but um, that's gonna to remain to be seen with um, post-licensure studies or uh, with uh, ongoing studies under an EUA. Uh, just to, to be very clear about this, uh, the EUA and licensure are different terms. Uh, uh, the EUA can be active only during a public health emergency, and it's based on uh, reason to believe a product is safe and effective, whereas licensure requires substantial evidence uh, for efficacy. So here's a, uh, on the next slide, a kind of recap of um, where we are with the vaccines under uh, OWS. Um, and some of the advantages of these. Uh, the uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are uh, mRNA vaccines. They have some advantages in rapid manufacturing and um, they're highly immunogenic. Uh, the uh, two adenovirus uh, vector vaccines show, uh, shown here also have uh, rapid manufacturing uh, capabilities. And um, in the case of the Janssen J&J, &J, uh, vaccine. Uh, this platform has been approved for Ebola viruses in, uh, in Europe. Um, and the uh, Novavax and uh, Sanofi um, adjuvant, uh, adjuvant and recombinant protein vaccines, um, uh, uh, these um, have some challenges in uh, manufacturing. They're not as fast, uh, but they are scalable. And um, uh, obviously uh, many vaccines that are already licensed uh, use this approach. On the next slide, um, you can see that uh, all of these uh, I just mentioned um, are in phase two or three with the uh, exception of the Sanofi uh, GSK vaccine, which uh, is expected to enter uh, phase three um, uh, probably by December. Um, there have been um, some uh, uh, manufacturer uh, uh, determined pauses and FDA holds that uh, now, um, as of a week ago, were all lifted uh, in the US. So these are ongoing. Um, on the next slide, um, uh, you can see the uh, sites uh, uh, testing vaccines uh, under OWS in the US. And uh, because vaccine uh, trials are event driven, to get a quick and definitive answer, you want sites vaccinating where the virus will be spreading just a few weeks or a few months later. And that's uh, one reason why uh, this collaborative network has so many sites throughout the country. This type of redundancy is clearly a good thing. On the next slide, uh, I've uh, just shown some of the uh, safety and immunogenicity uh, data of uh, one of the lead uh, vaccine candidates, the Moderna uh, mRNA. 
Uh, but what's shown here is true of uh, all of these lead candidates. Um, they appear to be safe and uh, uh, immunogenic uh, with minimal uh, side effects in the majority of participants. And there's abundant evidence for immunogenicity. Uh, this is a, a neutralizing antibody to the spike domains, uh, CD4 positive T cell responses to multiple epitopes and protection from SARS-CoV-2 challenge uh, uh, in, in challenge studies, um, including those in non-human primate models. On the next slide, um, this is the National Academy of Sciences uh, and Engineering and Medicine um, uh, framework for distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. And what you'll see is that um, uh, some patients with autoimmune diseases may fall into uh, the phase 1B category of high-risk comorbid conditions. Uh, for example, people with chronic kidney diseases. Others may be a better fit for phase 2, moderate-risk uh, comorbid conditions. And as you heard earlier, uh, some studies suggest that patients with stable autoimmune diseases may be at no greater risk than the general population, which of course is good news. Um, Let's go to the next slide. Um, no talk on vaccines would be complete without a few comments on vaccine hesitancy, a topic that's been uh, much in the news. And if you go to the next slide, um, here's a study published in, in June uh, uh, with the striking observation that just 50% of Americans plan to get a COVID-19 vaccine. A uh, more recent study survey uh, showed a decline in vaccine willingness from August to October. So these are very concerning and sobering. We seem to have lost Dan. Can you hear me? And communicating the roles that entities like NIH and oversight bodies and regulatory groups play in their independence from vaccine manufacturers. And uh, really important is a commitment to transparency. Um, and the FDA has uh, taken unusual steps in their guidance to industry in publishing that. Uh, vaccine manufacturers have taken some unusual steps in posting uh, final uh, clinical trial protocols uh, and enrollment data, including data on race and ethnicity, and a prompt sharing of uh, study results and the public deliberations of the uh, FDA advisory committees are all going to be very important in this regard. On the next slide, uh, you will see um, I think you need to advance uh, one more. Yeah, thank you. Um, prevention of uh, COVID-19 with a highly effective vaccine and um, if it's, uh, the uptake is widespread is still going to be just one um, facet in a multifaceted approach to uh, uh, treatment and prevention of COVID-19. And as you can see here on this uh, wheel diagram, there are many other uh, proven um, uh, uh, steps we can uh, take as a society to, um, to ensure that uh, um, COVID-19 uh, uh, becomes manageable. But hopefully vaccines will be on the scene very soon. And on the final slide, um, uh, here's a uh, web link to the COVID-19 uh, uh, prevention network uh, where you can get more information uh, on the vaccine trials. So with that, I will um, stop and uh, hopefully we have time to move on to the question session. So thank you, Dan. I think we'll move directly to uh, some of the questions because it's growing late. Uh, and I guess maybe we'll start with Zach and uh, ask whether COVID-19 causes autoimmune disease and is there a concern the vaccines might? Sure, thanks. Yeah, that's, that's a clearly very important question for many people. And, and the short answer is we don't know at this time whether COVID-19 causes autoimmune disease. There have been a number of case reports and anecdotal stories, um, but we really need more time, I think, to, to understand what the full impact will be of, of the infection on, on that risk. 
Um, in terms of the question of whether or not vaccines cause autoimmune diseases, I think that's very unlikely. Um, there are reports of, of auto, autoimmune um, uh, conditions occurring very, very rarely after um, vaccines in some trials. But again, those are very rare events. It's hard to know what to make of them. Um, and so that's, that's why the trials are so important for these vaccines as well. So the next question is for Dan, and it's whether there's a preferable vaccine for people with autoimmune diseases. And really related to that is, do we know how many people with autoimmune diseases have been enrolled in any of these trials? Dan, can you hear me? Maybe while we're trying to- Okay, uh, Betty, oh. I'm, I'm unmuted now. I think uh, okay. you can hear me, right? Okay, yes, absolutely. And you heard the yeah. question? So yes, I did. And I'm going to uh, address the second question first, which was, uh, do we know how many people with autoimmune diseases are enrolled in uh, the, the phase three trials? Um, the answer is uh, those data are being collected, but uh, they're not public and um, uh, they won't be analyzed till later on. Uh, as many of you, I think, know, uh, people with uh, uh, unstable autoimmune diseases or those on immunosuppressive regimens are not eligible for these trials. People with stable diseases who are not on um, immunosuppressive regimens are being enrolled, and uh, you know some of those diseases obviously are things like uh, type one diabetes, celiac disease, uh, autoimmune thyroiditis. Uh, but uh, there are many patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis also who would uh, fit those eligibility criteria. We'll uh, have to wait and see what those uh, what those data show. Um, but uh, to the other question was, uh, is there a preferable vaccine uh, for people with autoimmune diseases? And the uh, real answer, I think, is that uh, the most important message I can get across is that any vaccine is going to be better than COVID. This is a severe disease. Uh, and um, though there are understandable concerns about um, vaccines um, causing uh, uh, exacerbations. Uh, what's emerging now is that SARS-CoV-2 um, can probably uh, break immune tolerance, uh, resulting in uh, new autoreactivities or um, exacerbating previous autoreactivities. So this is a disease you want to avoid. Um, and um, if uh, a vaccine is available, I would uh, strongly recommend um, that you get it and not be overly concerned with um, unknowns currently about any particular vaccine. Thank you. Uh, and Arturo, uh, there's a question for you, which is how long does immunity last after infection? And does your convalescent serum give clues to that? And do we have any idea about how long it may last after vaccination? So uh, the answer to that, the, the correct answer is we don't know, but we, the, we can be optimistic that people who get sick, the majority make neutralizing antibody. And even though immunity wanes with time, that is normal. Immunity wanes with time to any infectious disease. The amount of antibody that is needed to prevent infection is, some, is a very small proportion of the antibody that is often made. Some of these people have neutralizing titers in the, in the thousands. So uh, I'm optimistic that the data with convalescent plasma is good for vaccines. And I'm optimistic that if you elicit the same types of antibody with vaccines, that you will protect against infection. So thank you. I want to ask if any of the panelists in the last minute have anything they want to uh, add. Is there any comments you think weren't covered and that you want to add to? Uh, so Betty, um, I, I uh, see the question, will vaccines be free? And I think that's an important one to, um, You're right. to address. And the simple answer is yes. Uh, federal government's gonna cover the cost 
of the vaccine itself and healthcare plans will cover the cost of administering the vaccines. Uh, no one's going to be required to pay for a vaccine and, and uh, nobody should expect to see co-pays. So that's a very important uh, piece of information to add and I think uh, uh, is very uh, good. So on behalf of uh, ARDA and uh, the entire community of individuals with autoimmune disease, I want to thank uh, Drs. Rotrosen, Casa Duval, and Wallace uh, for your presentations today, but really for your dedication to public health and to science. Uh, we've learned a great deal about COVID-19 and autoimmunity. Uh, please continue to check the ARDA website for uh, resources that will continue to update the information uh, available. And again, thank you all for joining us today.